Greetings, netizens of YouTube. It has come to my attention, but no little surprise, that the hate campaign continues against Jeremy Corbyn. Shockingly enough, it isn't just the Daily Mail who are willing to plough deep into the gutter for stories. Once revered media is also winning to muckrake. We will witness how that discredited Daily Mail hit piece previously covered was brought back to life and see further examples of propaganda against the Corbyn campaign. Finally, I will give my opinion on why I believe the media is using ridiculous sensationalised stories that the ignorant will swallow. In the finest British tradition of media, exemplified by the BBC in respected topical news programmes, Channel 4 News was for many years a leading example of in-depth and investigative reporting. Led by presenter Jon Snow, it was truly the news watched by those who made the news, or simply by those who would watch no other news programme. Recent years, however, have not been kind. As standards at the programme slipped, culminating with a scandal earlier this year involving presenter Cathy Newman. Newman visited a mosque on Visit a Mosque Day, and later claimed on Twitter that she had been rudely ushered out of the mosque by a man. The implication was that Western or non-Muslim women were not welcome. When video of the alleged incident emerged, showing that no such man existed, she offered a mealy-mouthed apology but not before the mosque received threats from members of the public for allegedly mistreating her. Despite the outcry, she was not sanctioned by Channel 4. Fast forward six months or so to the midst of the Corbyn hate campaign. Enter Cathy Newman. Newman cornered Corbyn in a street interview, picking up where the Daily Mail left off to press him on his alleged connection with the Holocaust denier Paul Eisen, quoting directly from the report I referenced in my previous video on the subject. The journalist that previously played into the dangerous and sensationalist narrative of insular intolerant Muslims in Britain now attempted to tar Corbyn with the same Islamic brush. With a tone not far from bloodlust, Newman repeatedly accused Corbyn of misjudgment, chiefly through guilt by tenuous association or simply through not knowing certain facts at the time. Please click the link if you are interested in the interview. I will not analyse the Channel 4 report, but I will say this. Had the original allegations made by Eisen been supported by an additional source and had evidence emerged of, say, anti-Semitic statements from Corbyn, the Channel 4 report would have been completely appropriate. The Channel 4 news team built a case for this story through statements made by former Labour leader Gordon Brown, by members of a Jewish community and from a leader of the Jewish community in London. But building a story upon the foundations of a paper house is worthless, despite going through the motions of creating a somewhat newsworthy story. This is the most dangerous type of propaganda because those watching don't notice and may believe they have witnessed fair quality journalism. The truth is, however, that the broadcast media bears as much responsibility for lower standards as the print and new media. And in case you're wondering, the BBC is not exempt, although they won't be covered here. Returning to that bastion of truth and common sense, the Daily Mail, and their campaign continues. One story that stands out is perhaps the most ridiculous piece I've read this year. Revealed how Jeremy Corbyn welcomed the prospect of an asteroid wiping out humanity, attacked pigeon prejudice, and demanded a ban on action ban toys. In 2003, Mr Corbyn back to motion, welcoming humanity being wiped out. Six years earlier, he attacked pigeon prejudice, insisting birds were clean. Mr Corbyn campaigned for rail staff to be allowed to keep calming beards. He also called for a ban on adverts for war toys for boys like Action Man. This reads like comedy, but it's no April Fool's joke. The rebellious backbencher who has never been a minister or held a shadow ministerial role, has backed a host of left-field causes, including a ban on war toys for boys, homeopathy in the NHS, and a ban on working in hot weather. He said, 
This house further believes that beards are healthy and create the sympathetic image necessary for staff dealing with deeply distressed passengers. Call me a hippie, but I tend to agree. In 1995, he called for a ban on adverts for war toys for boys, like action man figures, where there is a connection between such toys and male violence. Maybe a good thing. He's not saying ban the toys, as the headline claimed. He has also called for the legalisation for the possession of cannabis. Another basic error, and on the point absolutely outrageous. Dismissed the Serbian massacres in Kosovo as a genocide that never existed. Officially, Bosnia was the only scene of a genocide in the former Yugoslavia, so he's factually correct here. Not to mention that NATO bombed Serbia without the permission of the UN. Mr Corbyn also backed a motion welcoming England's success in the 1996 European Championships, but criticised the jingoism and nationalism in the pages of section of the tabloid press. Is this working on anybody? Because as it stands, I'm finding myself more supportive of Corbyn than before reading the article. Not only are the criticisms of Corbyn's policy positions entirely unconvincing, but in the desperate desire to muntsling, we not only see spelling mistakes, but we see complete conflation and confusion of utterly unrelated issues that are not even dated in order. Any further time spent on such a piece is wasted, but as always there is a link in the low bar for those with more patience than I have. Alongside the more traditional news, informational-based smears, there are the infotainment insult stories such as the male piece, with their talk of beards, sandal wearing and lentil eating. Are these stories designed to make the reader laugh? Certainly most people appear to recognise the absurdity. More interesting in my view is the role that humour plays in subtly influencing our opinions. It's a matter of fact that humour is often effective in poking fun at those who would not otherwise accept direct criticism. What is less known is to what degree people lower their defences whilst laughing at a message, but in turn subconsciously accept the underlying belief behind it. Advertisers have used humour for many years in promoting their products or ridiculing the products of their competitors in commercials and in the media. Humour plays a part in influencing people. Is it beyond the realms of possibility that certain sections of the media would take part in such a laughter campaign against Jeremy Corbyn? That while we are laughing at the absurdity of what we read, we might think, well, I'd like to give him a go, but he's a clown candidate and nobody's going to take him seriously. Surely exposing somebody to protracted ridicule has an effect on how others view them. Then again, that doesn't quite explain George Bush, or the popularity of Donald Trump for that matter. Although I seem to remember an expression about how Americans prefer to be smarter than their presidents. The media may blacken his name and damage Corbyn's reputation, but I will continue to speak out about the pitiful standards of journalism we are witnessing, the blatant smear tactics and manipulation. However, it's also vital to discuss real issues around us that can affect positive change. Time focused on this subject is time that could have been spent discussing issues of pressing concern. My next video will be a report about migration and I will show you pictures of the unfolding crisis that is headed towards those in Europe. Things are worse than you think.